Welcome back everyone, this is Angel Miller with Phalanx and if you're finding this on YouTube that's P-H-A-L-X dot com uh, Tonight we're going to be speaking with uh, Greg Kaminsky He's the publisher of the Occult of Personality podcast and that's Occult of Personality dot net and uh, Greg has interviewed um, many uh, leading authors and uh, practitioners of uh, different types of spirituality over the years, including such people as uh, Lon Milo Duquette, uh, Mitch Horowitz, uh, David Beth, and uh, in fact, he's also interviewed uh, Craig and uh, myself as well a couple of times about our own writing and our, our books as well. But tonight I'm going to be interviewing uh, Greg, and we're going to be discussing the subject of initiation and what is it. Uh, what are the prerequisites for authentic initiation? Is there such a thing as counter initiation? And uh, we'll also be looking briefly at a few different traditions, uh, such as uh, the occult and Freemasonry. Well, with that, let's begin. Greg Kaminsky, thank you for joining us. Thank you, Angel. It's a pleasure to be here. Oh, it's great to be speaking to you again. And um, you're pretty well known. You're the podcaster of A Cult of Personality, and uh, which which has been around for um, quite a few years now. And uh, in my view, it's the, probably the best uh, podcast uh, on esotericism and occultism uh, on the net. And thank uh, you. Oh, you're quite welcome. But uh, I just wanted to get to know uh, a little bit more about your personal journey and what is your background. Um, in that subject, uh, what kind of experiences have you had and um, how did it begin and what, what was your interest originally and how has it grown? Well, that's a good question. Um, I don't know how far back I should go here. <laughs> um, that's always a tricky one, I know. Yeah, yeah. So um, let's see, when I was a very young child, where I and we, we lived in a neighborhood called King's Court, and it was on a road called Templar Way. So I think that was kind of the beginning of it. Ah. Um, and I remember one time, let's see, when I was five, it was a very strange situation. It was a summer night. We were playing outside, and I just ended up looking up at the stars. And it was odd because for some reason you could see like every single star in the sky and it was magnificent and I just like laid back in the grass and I like completely lost any kind of self identity mm. for a few minutes and as a five year old I had absolutely no idea what the hell was happening um, so I think that was kind of the first moment where I was aware that there was a lot more to the cosmos than I was going to be able to understand yeah um, I think from there, I always had an interest in like fantasy and uh, Lovecraft and okay. Dungeons and Dragons and, yeah, you know, using the mind to try to kind of escape, um, you know, mundane reality as I saw it at that time. Yeah. And I think uh, my next taste of this sort of thing was um, in college joining a college fraternity uh, i had no idea at the time that it was you know based on freemasonry and there was in fact other sort of occult sort of things happening um in the fraternity yeah i mean in in sort of like the ritual it, okay. ritual aspects of it i wish i could talk about it but unfortunately okay. i've actually re <laughs> i've read some uh, rituals of some fraternities a long time ago and yeah it's, uh, they are the older ones clearly based on Freemasonry has to be said. Although I think they're sort of um, a much more basic version, a sort of stripped down version of Freemasonry. Yeah, no, it's definitely stripped down. I mean, it's, I think I can say this, it's one initiation and not three. Okay. Um, but I was a member of a fraternity called Chi Phi, and it was actually the first college fraternity founded in 1824. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah, and... Um, so it had an interesting history. I think the first instance of it, they called the Secret Order of Chi Phi at Hobart College. And then there was also an instance at Princeton and then another one somewhere in the south, and they all kind of merged. But um, the resulting ritual was definitely 
stripped down, but also a, more occult than than masonry. Oh, really? Yeah. So, oh, well, we uh, should get on to occultism and masonry in a minute. But so, yeah. um, so where did where did you go from there? Because obviously, you you started to develop um, a serious inter interest in esotericism and and yeah. this kind of thing. So, so from there, I think I had like a several years, of kind of a break, and then um, I developed a, a big interest in neo shamanism. Oh, okay. And um, I had an experience with Salvia Divinorum. I, I, I don't actually know who that is. Uh, that's a it's a shamanistic plant. Oh, really? Okay. You can, there's various ways you can partake of it. Um, I smoked it. Okay. And not, I would not recommend anybody do this, but I had like a yeah. very intense Kundalini experience as a result of that, okay. and I had no idea what that was at the time. So, mm. and my whole intention in doing it in the first place was because I felt a very much lack of a purpose in life and I didn't mm. know exactly what it was I was supposed to be doing or, yeah. and then boom, this happened and you know, I think it was, I interpreted it as some kind of a, a pointer to me that like, okay, this is the direction you need to pursue, like, yeah. What is this? Figure this out. Yeah. And that led me to all sorts of interesting things, you know, all kinds yeah. of esoteric ideas, you know, all kinds of things in mythology, ancient civilizations, alternative history, you know, and that it ties right into conspiracies and secret societies and esotericism in the West mm -hmm. and then into the East. Yeah, and so why would you not recommend um, taking that path of, uh, I guess, taking hallucinogens or? Um, I, I, I guess I would say because I don't want to be responsible for anybody who has some sort of bad reaction to it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I, personally, I, I agree, and I, I would say that uh, you mentioned Kundalini, and I think that. You know, in this in this day and age, I mean, people do take these things, but uh, I would say personally that, uh, you know, I practiced Kundalini and chakra meditation for many, many, many years. And uh, honestly, I think uh, the, no kind of hallucinogen could come come close to it, really, if uh, if you're doing it properly. And uh, you should be cultivating the mind, not not relying on these other substances. Yeah, no, I, I completely agree. I think it's like a, um, it's like sneaking in the back door versus you know yeah. being being invited in. Yeah, through right. The front door. I, that's how I've heard it described. Uh, I would agree with that. Um, but I also have some question about whether that experience like opened up a lot right. of things that were otherwise kind of. Uh, closed off in me mm -hmm. um so again i'm not advocating anyone do it that's what i did it it definitely had an effect but um yeah i wouldn't recommend it yeah and and so from there so from there um i began uh developing an interest in more western style meditation and ritual magic mm. and I started learning about alchemy and the more internal aspects of the alchemical tradition. And I think one of the books I practiced from really devoutly was uh, The Tower of Alchemy, a David Goddard book. Okay. And I had some really profound experiences from that. And I think from there, I'd ended up, you know, joining an esoteric order that was like Golden Dawn derivative. Oh, okay. So I, I and then from there, I, I ended up going down to uh, Georgia to meet Alan Greenfield and okay. have the uh, gnostic and apostolic consecration and the points chawed and mm. that that was probably 
the most intense initiatory experience I think I've ever had. Mm. Okay. And I actually have a question at this <laughs> point. I wasn't actually planning to ask you this, but I think it's a, a relevant question. So what I question about things such as in alchemy, um, Western alchemy, that is, and, and some uh, occult groups and lineages, that it that I get the feeling that it may not be terribly authentic. And I, I wonder how it compares to uh, more uh, longer traditions such as Hindu Tantra or Buddhist Tantra or something like that. Do you have any thoughts about that? Yeah, I, I have some thoughts about that. Um, so I, I, I think I went through a long period of questioning the authenticity of it. Yeah. Um, initially, I accepted it at face value, and then I went through a period of thinking that, um, that there's no such thing as alchemy if you don't have you know laboratory work accompanying the inner work. And then the more I investigated it, and the more I learned, the more I came to believe that what I regard as like the primordial esoteric tradition worldwide, yeah. you know, if we could break it down, you know, beyond the barriers of culture and language and religion mm -hmm. has to do with essentially what I would call practices that uh, magnetize the solar energy into the human body mm -hmm. and thereby produce a physiological reaction changing the blood chemistry and producing you know reactions in uh, all of the endocrine system yeah. and uh, in the brain and um, so that that and and different techniques for doing this, uh, that's what I regard as the the real primordial tradition. So, mm. I would say that the techniques that we have in the West, you know, they may not be as straight a path. Uh, they may you mm. may not be able to trace it back, but the techniques are really similar. And the philosophy is really similar to the East. I've seen it compared as in Tower of Alchemy to the Vajrayana Buddhism. Yeah, I've seen it compared to the 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 Shaivism and Tantra. Mm -hmm. So, and do do you think that there's a similarity because it was a, a somehow uh, rediscovered independently, or do you think there's an influence? Of oh, I'm I think there's an influence from the East. Yeah, me too, to be honest. And I, I think even with Alistair Crowley, or, um, who's definitely one of the uh, more more influential occultists of the last couple of hundred years, and I, I mean, he was uh, very much influenced by the East. So, yes, certainly, and, and obviously others as well, like Blavatsky, certainly, um, but, Albert uh, Pike too. Yeah, even. yeah. And um, yeah, and I think maybe some people will be wondering about this uh, the literal sort of physical transformation of the you know, endocrine system. But uh, but I would say that that definitely is the case, and it definitely is the case with uh, Kundalini and chakra meditation. But but my um, my advice to people would be to also take up some kind of uh, physical discipline as well, some kind of martial art, uh, even if it's uh, just tai chi or, or, or at least yoga or something as well I, I don't think you should leave the physical side out um, no i don't i don't think so either yeah i mean it it only enhances it and supplements it yeah and i would say as well that in my own experience not to make it all about me but but in my own experience that um uh, I found that, um, say, chakra meditation is uh, a lot more powerful if um, well, when my body is uh, stronger and I've been uh, working out more. Actually, oh yeah, I, yeah. I second that. I mean, yeah. completely. Get and, and getting rest and eating properly. Yeah, of course. Definitely. I mean, those are. It's like a three pillar system, just like Mason. Yeah. Any anything else. Yeah, absolutely. Well, let's not stop there. We can can move on as well. So uh, and um, so so you clearly you have a uh, a background in fraternalism, then esoteric uh, societies and alchemy, which is already quite a mix. But uh, is oh, there any? certainly, yeah. So then you have the sort of like ecclesiastical sort of thing thrown in there, um, right? So 
you know, when we talk about initiation, that's definitely something to, to really touch on. So we can go back to that. Yeah. Um, and then it was shortly after that that I ended up becoming a Freemason. Okay. And from there, uh, it's been just learning more and more and more as the journey unfolds. So. Yeah. And how do you feel that uh, Freemasonry relates to, um, say, spirituality and esotericism? Because, uh, you know, obviously uh, some people would say that, no, it's just an old boys club and it's about charity. And um, I think there would mostly be non-Masons, but I think even some, a few Freemasons would say that. And then, of course, at the other end of the spectrum, I've met Freemasons who think it's all literally about occultism. So what, what's your take on that? Yeah, my take on it is Masonry is designed by men that I would consider geniuses. Mm. And my experience tells me that what you'll find in Freemasonry, in the Lodge, is a reflection of, you know, yourself. You know, what you, what do you seek? What do you expect to find? You're going to find it there. That's been my mm. experience. You want to find the esoteric, you will find it there. You want to right, find the right. mundane, you will find it there. You want to be bored, you'll be bored there. You want to be entertained, you'll be entertained. Um, there's something to satisfy, I think, all levels of consciousness simultaneously. Right. And actually, I would say that I think that actually applies even to uh, people who are non, uh, non-Masons, who... who uh, you know, the, some people are convinced that it's so secret you could never find out anything and will consequently never even do a, a Google search. <laughs> on, <laughs> and then there are people who think it can't be and I'm going to find out about it and they end up joining. So I think the, it, it is a curious fact that uh, uh, people's perceptions seem to play very much into Freemasonry more than with other things, I think. Yeah, it has a curious history, I think, yeah. and, and sort of the mystery about it which as an institution freemasonry whether intentionally or not really cultivates it because they never sort of answer any of the the ch- the negative charges and mm-hmm. they deny that there's actually any secrecy even though there's there are secrets and and the much of the secrecy is really about you know not being able to convey some experiences that I, there's certain things you just can't put into words, I think. And to me, I consider that part of the secrecy. Yeah, and I think the secrecy is also that it does take some kind of uh, reflecting on the various rituals and symbols as well, right? And they all have different influences and and different connections between symbols. And, and it's you have to sort of think through it, right, and come to... I don't, I don't mean come to an individual conclusion, but to understand it um, deeply. And I think that once you do that, then uh, uh, you kind of discover a secret within it, right? Oh, yeah. So, And those doors begin to open up in your mind. And yeah. it's just a, like an unfoldment, unfolding process. Yeah. So... Perhaps um, we could uh, discuss initiation a little bit as well because we've been mm-hmm. talking about Freemasonry and obviously initiation is a big part of that. So perhaps I, uh, I could just ask a very basic question. Uh, in, in your opinion, what is initiation? It's uh, an event or an experience that implants the potential within a person to transform them in some way. Yeah usually positive um right and i think you could break it down because you have initiations that are done by other people yeah and then you have what i would consider like initiatory experiences that an individual undergoes uh that are you know it's just sort of life in in action and they may go through experiences that are initiatory. Yeah. And I think you you can't sort of say one's real initiation and the other one's not. They're in my mind they're both valid initiatory 
experiences, but they're different. Mm -hmm. And they're both important in, in this respect, I think. You know, in, in someone who undergoes the ritual initiation with other people will almost certainly experience the other sort of initiation, I think. Yeah, definitely. And uh, incidentally, Mercia Eliade, um, who is very critical of uh, modern occult groups and modern initiation, um, he, he seemed to think that it was in literature such as uh, James Joyce and uh, uh, great sort of Western literature that, that one could get some sense of the numinous. And I think maybe what he's saying is that uh, it is a kind of experience in life in a way in more ordinary events, which I, I would totally agree with. But I think that the, uh, the sort of more uh, fraternal and initiatic uh, sort of ritualistic way is also uh, still valid, which is probably why I would disagree with him. Yeah, I mean that's an interesting point that he makes. Um, I yeah. think I think you could one can have that sort of experience in a variety of ways. You know, whether it's through a medium like art, literature, music, yeah. or nature, uh, or simply contemplation. Um, you know, I don't know. To, in 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 these sort of realms, there's no real boundaries of of the way it can manifest. Yeah, I I would say personally that I, where I see a weakness with uh, initiation today is that um, it seems to me that initiation can be very fragmentary in a way that uh, that you join an occult group to get some kind of initiation, and then you go to a Zen center to learn meditation, and then uh, Maybe you become a Freemason and you you uh, practice a martial art as well, because it seems like there's not um, as, for example, with the, the samurai where there was a, a coherent uh, culture where they would practice meditation, learn martial arts, obviously learn the ethics of Zen Buddhism as well. And I think that that doesn't exist with you in, anymore. Um, maybe in monasteries or something. Yeah, I mean, I, was, I think, you know, you got to go to, like, you know, the mountains in China or, you know, somewhere in India. I mean, yeah. in our culture, even, you know, monastery atmosphere don't offer the type of thing you're talking about. No. So what, what, what do you think we can do as uh, people living in the modern era where it is a bit fragmentary? I think we do what we can. You know, I don't think it's our job to, like, repair what's been broken because it's yeah. not fixable. You know, we can't take the Western esoteric tradition and, like, patch it together even more than it already is. So yeah, that's right. I, I would advocate people do what they're able to do. Um, take initiation, you know, and don't take it lightly uh, mm. and, and try to work the degree uh, recognize that its uh, intention is to open up the energy centers and you know you it, you should be experiencing things you know differently perhaps um, mm. it's it's something to be cultivated I think is important yeah uh, I think there's a responsibility you know not just on the the initiator but on the person being initiated on the candidate because yeah, you know they're being it's like a seed being planted you know but the candidate or the the one being initiated is responsible for growing it uh, yeah. so uh, there's a, a t it's it's a two-sided issue i think no no uh, it is of course yeah and and um not not to mention martial arts too much, but but I think uh, sometimes it it actually makes things a little clearer to refer to martial arts and you know um, anyone who's practiced in any kind of um, uh, martial arts class will, will have witnessed people coming being very enthusiastic and then dropping out after a week or three weeks or a month and it's like well I mean how much of a chance did you really give yourself to uh, to develop the the strength or whatever or the dexterity that you need 
not mm. much, right? And it's, no, sure, not of much. Course, yeah, and of course it's the same with um, with uh, esoteric spirituality or any kind of spirituality as well. I mean, it's not, it's not, nothing's going to happen over <laughs> overnight, right? So, well, that's an understatement. I I feel like this discipline, is, and it should be approached as a discipline, and it, it requires study. It requires patience. It requires time. Um, people generally want to know all the secrets and you know tell yeah. me everything right away yeah uh, and you know you just have to laugh at the immaturity of someone who approaches the sacred in you know in the manner where they're just demanding yeah demanding the sacred you know give me the secrets of the universe because you know i've done nothing to deserve them yeah that's right yeah yeah, well, I've certainly witnessed that myself, to be honest. But uh, and obviously, you you have as well. Oh yeah, uh, that's very unfortunate. Clearly, yeah, mm. I think uh, you know many times the people doing it are 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 oftentimes like cavalier about it because they they don't even realize how offensive it it really is. Yeah, no, of course not. But um, uh, just getting back to initiation in the modern age as well, and. Do you do you think that um, esoteric spirituality, um, uh, which uh, could be uh, neo paganism or Kabbalah or something else from the West, do you do you think that this is the best route for us today, or do you think that we should perhaps just adopt, um, say, Tibetan Buddhism and practice that diligently? Uh, what's your feelings? Uh, I, I I guess my my feeling would be that um, I, I don't mean I don't want to offend anybody in saying this because the East yeah. has like really rich traditions and I respect course, them yeah. you know greatly and I've you know certainly practiced them and uh, yeah me too obviously you know, yeah. so but what I what I would say is that you know if there's just a desire to you know completely abandon like the Western tradition or or traditions that one is interested in and practicing, you know, for something Eastern simply because it's, you know, more pure or what is perceived as more authentic, you know, that I think shows like a complete poverty of understanding of the richness of the Western yeah. traditions, the history behind it. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I would also argue a, a lack of understanding that, you know, the same shortcomings and you know lack of authenticity exists in all of the eastern traditions that you can find just as much as it does in the west yeah uh, it may not be highlighted as much uh it may be covered up uh it may not be visible to people who are not there in the culture or speak the language but you know spirituality is a earthly thing and it's a concept and it, it's trying to get to something that is not right right that's something that's actually real and mm. so inevitably the earthly is going to be corrupt even if it doesn't start out that way yeah of course yeah and it so and i'm not saying it's totally corrupt but in some aspects is bound to be yeah and I mean, maybe that's a gnostic -y kind of a point of view, but it's just how I feel. Yeah, I mean, I would say as well that, um, you know, there's a lot of the trashing of the Western tradition, and there's, you know, there's a lot of valid criticisms that can and probably in many cases should be made. But I think that uh, we do have to get to know our uh, ancient culture and the and history and traditions not e not even necessarily to practice them but i think that uh it's a bit like uh our family in a way right we we may not get on with our family and we may have issues with our family and it may seem to us that it would just be so much nicer to have uh, another family that seems much more functional than ours but i think at some point for one's own sort of uh, maturity uh you have to make peace with uh, with your family and um and and see what's good about them and i think that's the same with uh with the, the western 
uh, traditions as well that you have to also acknowledge what's good about uh, those as well um, to sort of move forward as a as a, a thinking and uh, spiritual individual. No, I completely agree. I, I feel like it's the same as being initiated. Just like you have yeah. to cultivate that, you have to cultivate the tradition. You know, if you think it's deficient, find yeah. out why. Yeah, exactly. You know, investigate it. Is it really? Or are you accepting a point of view at face value without really doing your own research? I mean, I can't advocate enough that people just throw out everything that they don't really know for sure and haven't researched themselves and can prove themselves. Mm. Because if, if you do that, you're going to find uh, you're open to new ideas, for different ways of seeing things. Uh, and you may come to understand that the Western tradition is complex, it's beautiful, um, it's been, you know, designed and conceived and inspired by people who were some of the most brilliant minds of the last several hundred years. And and I don't think people often, you know, appreciate the fact that their esoteric education is deficient. And I'm sorry to say that, but in many respects it is because, well, just in as an example, like uh, we always hear of the maxim, you know, do, you know, know thyself, mm -hmm. which was one of only three of the maxims of the Delphic Oracle. The first one was moderation, indicating morality and uh, the having, you know, conditioning yourself physically, you know, morally, spiritually, so that you, you know, are capable of undertaking that journey. And then the second is know thyself. And then the third is once you, you know, know thyself by understanding natural philosophy and your place in the cosmos, then you can know divinity. Yeah. And it's in that order. But if you leave out the first and the last, you know, where are you going to end up? Right, exactly. Yeah, and it, of course, this is uh, something that we like to do in the modern world, right? We, we take the one thing that seems to... Uh, uh, represent our own sort of imbalances and then say that that's the truth so I mean I, I can see that in the ancient world knowing yourself was a pretty radical thing but now everybody knows themselves but they don't know anything else oh, I don't know I would I would argue that no most people don't know themselves well, no they don't I mean what they what they know is a sort of like fantasy version of themselves right but they're always fixated on who they are but they don't know a lot about culture or anything else particularly nothing positive anyway it seems yeah and I would even argue that even if they didn't learn anything about anything anything else if they were simply to just turn their attention inwards and try to trace back the source of consciousness like just doing that would be you know a good start yeah in terms of like be, that idea of knowing thyself because mm -hmm. you know otherwise if you don't know the source of consciousness in your in you how you, how are you going to understand you know anything that stems from it right right exactly yeah well on that note perhaps um perhaps we could talk about uh what might be called counter initiation which i think is a real thing i don't know i don't know if you do but but i think that some occult and esoteric spiritual um organizations and maybe not even esoteric or occult ones as well but sort of more cult-like groups as well um offer initiations but what they're teaching them is sort of uh sometimes it's political and sometimes it's um, orientated towards uh, uh, satisfying a guru but what they're being taught is essentially delusional and is never going to help them and is not in any sense authentic initiation what, what's your take boy that's a tough one <laughs> uh, 
that's a tough one. I mean, in theory, I would agree. There's certainly things out there that kind of superficially like <clears throat> just like match up with these, what you're talking about. Um, but this is a really weird road, you know, this esoteric path, sure, spirituality. Yeah. So my thoughts on this are what ends up happening is people go through what could be described as counter initiatory experiences. But yeah, but what ends up happening is, you know, either they learn from it or yeah. they, they don't and mm -hmm. they experience suffering and mm -hmm. You know, in a way, that's a valid initiatory experience. So, is it really counter initiatory or not? And and the other part of that is, you know, true teachings that are valid or going to help them or hurt them. I mean, in the esoteric realm, it's so subjective because you know, from one lineage, so, you know, looking to another lineage you know something is completely disreputable and invalid and won't work mm. you know but you, so I, it's it's hard for me to to really cast aspersions in, in that way and and make judgments about that i i know what works for me yeah but, but i can't really judge what's what's a counter initiatory for other people i guess that's the way i would look mm. at it i'm just not uh in a position where I, I would say, oh, you know, I, you shouldn't do that because that's really not a valid initiatory path. Yeah. Uh, I, if, if someone asked me what I would do if it were me, you know, I could answer that. That mm. that's about as far as I could go with it. I think. Yeah, I mean, I think that there is such a thing as counter initiation, and I would say if if people are being initiated. And are being promised, um, you know, some kind of uh, access to the to the divine, but are getting sort of sick, and their lives are falling apart, and all, all that's becoming, all the, all that's happening to them is they're just becoming more materialistic or confused. Then, then that is a ca clearly counter initiatory. Yeah, I, but, I agree. That is counter initiatory. <clears throat> but I would also argue that it's the initiate or the, their, you know, it's their responsibility to. Oh yeah, wa no, wake sure. up, and if and if yeah. what they're involved with isn't waking them up. Yeah. It's certainly counter initiatory and you know they bear some responsibility for buying into it. Yeah, no for sure. Well, maybe I, I could ask this. Uh is is it purely just sort of personal interpretation or or do you think that there are real uh standards to initiation in that a, a, an authentic initiation should include uh specific things or a specific orientation? Oh, I think it definitely should include specific things. Yeah. Uh, uh, and what do you think that they would be? Uh, it's, you know, one of them is going to be some sort of an invocation of deity or divinity or yeah. spirit or something along those lines. Mm -hmm. The other is going to be an oath or obligation of some sort. Uh, um, to? Uh, that... that that I think is open to interpretation, okay. um, but it's definitely involving some sort of vow and some sort of secrecy as a result of that vow, right? And which is, in a way, as a kind of to put some kind of restrictions on the consciousness, in a way, or or behavior. Yeah, I think it's not only to put restrictions on it, but it's also to emphasize, you know, the importance of what is being received. Right, right, sure. I mean, in the sense that, um, yeah, I mean, that's clearly the case, right? But restrictions, not in a sort of uh, masochistic sense, but uh, but that, um, uh, I mean, even with something like positive thinking, which I'm not necessarily advocating, but, you know, I think part of the idea of positive thinking is that you just limit your thinking to, to things that are uh, uh, empowering and, and, and don't allow your mind to sort of wander into negative and, oh uh, yeah, depressing that's thinking. So great that point. Sense, yeah. That's a great point. And I think there's another aspect to it that, which is restrictive, which is that once you pass that point, the information revealed is restricted to the people who have taken that initiation and what is taught is then exclusive. 
So you, yeah. you, know, you have this elite elitism then is created. Yeah. Well, and is elitism uh, necessary? Because I think that some people would say that, no, that's a bad thing and, and it should all just be open. I mean, there's like an open source golden dawn. I mean, I'm not criticizing that. I don't really know what they do, but it seems like the idea is that... It's, well, just... I guess I'm saying elitism in the sense that um, it's you're, you're separated from the people who haven't had the initiation. Even if the right. information is available... Yeah, people who haven't had the experience, because we're going to talk about another aspect of initiation that's necessary in just a moment. Okay. Uh, so the experience is is it like the information itself is, uh, I think, secondary to the the manner and the the environment in which it's delivered. And like you said, like setting these boundaries around it, I think has has that effect yeah and i would say in regard to elitism i mean that's sort of um, an unpopular word but but a, a, an example that craig always uses is uh you know would you want to go to your uh doctor if you wasn't you know educated uh at a proper by in a proper tradition or you know lineage and i was just making it up and obviously we wouldn't right and the same with martial arts you wouldn't really want to practice martial arts under somebody who was just making stuff up right i mean no. the, the, i mean there are levels of of knowledge and understanding and and um you know uh, that's the way you learn is to to practice under someone who knows more than you and if and if initiation is real then there will be people who know more than you and that's just the end of it right and you'll know more than some other people so Sure. I just, like, on the topic of elitism, I think, you know, there's several ways to look at elitism. You know, one of them, you know, you can be sort of uh, against the idea altogether, but yeah. it, how productive is that? Right, you know, right. The other ways is like you want to be elite or you want to learn from someone who is elite. Right. Exactly. So, yeah. And yeah, I and think it, that's what you were saying. Yeah. No, absolutely. And and honestly, I want good examples around me uh, to to learn from. And um, uh, I, I think we were, I was saying this to you off air at, at, at another point that uh, you know um, we can we can learn from anyone. And you know when I, I go to a martial arts class and I see someone who's uh, not as advanced as me, but giving a hundred percent of their uh, effort, then that reminds me to uh, put a hundred percent of my effort in, and they, that's in in a way, I'm you know I'm learning from them. But uh, you know, so uh, so in a certain sense, we can always learn from anyone. But uh, um, no, I would encourage people to learn from the best. Oh yeah, for and sure. and only from the best, and don't and don't waste your time with you know teachers and. And people who you don't think are the best. No, absolutely. That that's that, that's absolutely right. Of course. Yeah, and I think the idea of emulation or having an example is really important, and and that goes right back to the origins of Western esotericism too. You know, the idea that you know we can ascend to the throne of God by by emulating the angels. Yeah. You know that that's the whole point of it. Right, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And so you you were mentioning that we would uh, discuss another aspect of initiation. Oh yeah, the other aspect of initiation, yeah. which is I think a, another key part of it, which is the at some point during the ritual, there's a physical contact between the initiator and the candidate. Right. There's an energetic transmission of some sort or another. Mm. Yeah. Uh, so that is a key aspect of initiation, and um, there's also uh, sort of energetic uh, things going on where symbols are used. Uh, or they might be introduced into the candidate's aura. Um, you know, there may be psychic uh, energy employed. And yeah. that type of thing. So those are all yeah. key aspects, and I think these are why a lot of people feel like the idea of self initiation is is a myth because you don't have the physical energy transfer and all the psychic energy type of thing happening, you know. Let alone the ritual itself. So yeah, 
You know, in in that respect, I would agree. Like, I think that self initiation is valid. It's just different, and you, you it can't replace a real, valid, authentic initiation from like a, a real lineage. Mm-hmm. Uh, that can't be duplicated or substituted in any way. Yeah, no, I would agree absolutely. So for me, the most impactful initiation I experienced was the ritual consecration in the apostolic and Gnostic succession. And that was done by Tao Allen Greenfield on Mount Arabia. I think think that Mm. was 2007, if I'm not mistaken. Mm. And that in, in every aspect was was much more of an impact uh, than anything else I've had before or since. Oh, really? That's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. So, uh, I don't even know, I couldn't even begin to tell you like the various ways it's affected me and Mm. what I do and my life and everything. Mm. And how do you, how do you feel about um, esotericism in relation to Western culture in, in this regard? That uh, normally esotericism comes a par- as a part of um, uh, a, a religion. So Sufism is obviously a part of Islam, uh, but we don't really have. Um, uh, a religion in the West. I mean, I know Christianity still exists, although it's, I think, in, in America where it's probably stronger than most other Western countries. I think even there it's sort of largely politicized and, and isn't really a religion for, for, for many of the practitioners. Um, but uh, w- how does uh, esotericism relate to that? Because I think one of the aspects of, of having a religion. Uh, and then having esotericism as well is that the religion provides you with some kind of orientation and a sort of moral foundation for the more uh, subtle uh, work later on, right? Well, I, th- I think there's so many, so many aspects of, of religion, um, and and I would even argue that even if you don't think you have a religion, if you're practicing esotericism. You know, even chaos magic, these ideas and philosophies come out of the Western tradition itself, yeah, like the Western cool. philosophic tradition. Yeah. So you, you can, I mean, you can try, but you can't really divorce it from Christianity, I, I, in my opinion. And I think yeah. not, not recognizing that is just an attempt to like decontextualize it. Yeah, it, and it, for some people that may be more comfortable. I don't know. Yeah, uh, for well, me, you know, when you're searching for truth, like you want to try to actually find, okay, well, here's historical truth, and hmm. and so that would say that you know, despite you know rampant secularism in the West, uh, this esoteric tradition has come out of you know, or maybe a better way to interpret it. You know, you could say this traditions come through Christianity. You know, if if yeah. you're not happy identifying it as Christian, don't. You know, do what do what they did in the Renaissance. Say this came through Christianity. It's not. Mm-hmm. It it was existed before Christianity. Christianity adopted it, and and it, it still exists to us today. You know, if that makes mm-hmm. you happy, I think you could do that. Yeah, I mean, I I mean, I, I agree, and I think that the even. The, the sort of moral um, uh, zeitgeist of today, even though it seems to be completely divorced from Christianity, I think that the the sort of very hyper moral age that we're living in, uh, essentially, it, they are Christian morals, right? But um, although people wouldn't like to think that, uh, I think. But um, so how how does something like paganism or neo paganism um, work into this? I mean, is is it possible? Uh, to practice that, or is it a, a sort of Christianized version? What do you think? Well, yeah, probably not the right person to ask <laughs> about this. But I mean, from where I sit, uh, like it, nobody's beliefs are really limited. So if you, yeah. you know, if you want to go that path, 
you know, paganism. There's there's no restriction. Um, and again, you know, this this esoteric tradition, if we see it as a continuous stream, it existed prior to Christianity. If yeah. if you want to tap into it at that level or at that sort of time slice, if you will, uh, you can do that. Mm. You know, and some people might say, well, it's a reconstruction or whatever. Well, you know, yeah. what are you, what are you going to do? I mean, uh, these beliefs don't have to be handed down from one living person to another. They can still survive in, yeah. in many other forms, and they do. So I would argue that, you know, in the same way that the ancient mysteries of the classical world, you know, kind of descended in through Kabbalah, you could and you can tap into aspects of it there. I mean, mm -hmm. there, there's different ways you can approach this stuff. And Yeah. Yeah, and I think also as well, another way is to not necessarily create a kind of ritual group or anything like that, but, but to sort of understand ideas from different uh, times, uh, whether it's the pre-Christian era or from Hermeticism, and in a way to sort of uh, just think about those uh, those ideas and to let them sort of um, uh, inform your own understanding in a way, uh, and and let it um, sort of guide your own actions in a certain sense. Yeah, I mean the biggest thing I could advocate for people is if you, no matter what path you're on, is to to delve as deeply as you can into it F read the historical material read the you know the primary source material yeah you know, absolutely. read the scholarship on it you know yeah. even if you don't agree with it just find out what they're saying no absolutely and you know I learn as much as you can because that way you know no one is is going to be like you know, kind of like uh, reconstructing it in a sense, because you'll have a much better idea of of what really was. And and if you add into that, like learning more about philosophy and reading the philosophy of that tradition, uh, and reading the theology of that tradition, whatever it may be. Yeah. You know, the great thinkers, because. I, that's something I, I think the modern age is really in poverty is like the in ancient times even up until a few hundred years ago the most brilliant minds were heavily interested in theology religion mm -hmm. esotericism and these things and yeah. and in modern times the most brilliant minds for the most part are not interested in these subjects yeah and they're also not very interesting Right, but uh, yeah, yeah, and I think another th uh, point might be that I think it's not purely intellectual either. That the, for me anyway, I think there's also a kind of aesthetic element as well. Um, you know, for example, in art, um, and, and, and in, in literature as well. Oh yeah, um, art, literature, music. I mean, yeah. these are these are the highest expressions of human creativity, and yes. you know, if we listen to our wisdom traditions, they're inspired. You know, they're not just uh, creative, if you will. Yeah, and I think you know, for example, um, the writing of of Goethe or uh, the operas of Mozart or uh, the paintings of uh, Franz von Stuck. I mean, I think that. Even if you just took those, I mean, uh, I, I think that that would in itself be a kind of a, a transformative experience if you just just really paid attention to uh, to to, th to those uh, manifestations of uh, art and literature. Yeah, it's interesting. Actually, somebody said to me the other day that they don't really find the most magical people within the occult and esoteric community. They yeah. find they find a lot of theorizing and people who like to read and book collectors and they say they find the most magical people in the art community and poets and writers and you know yeah although and I, and I would say on a lot of levels I'd have to agree with that yeah although I would I would have to say that I think that 
that's true but it's probably people who are slightly outside of the uh let's say the business of art yeah which, cer <laughs> certainly certainly yeah you know it's sort of more like self-taught artists or artists that are a bit kind of on the fringes that aren't going to be shown in galleries unless it's some kind of esoteric gallery because i think that you know what the mainstream art world produces is completely tedious yeah and, thank you for making that distinction yeah <laughs> but i know but i think that in if there was anything that would make me defend um or any one thing that would make me defend uh esotericism and uh occultism and this this very curious world would be that i think it 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 does really um promote uh, a lot of creativity and i think that that's really great and you do see people who are creating uh, art uh that is interesting or or belly dance or or music or whatever and none of this stuff w would be produced if it wasn't for this uh very curious uh tradition of western esotericism and yeah. I, think, I think that's a very positive uh, positive thing and i think it says something very good about that tradition no, I think that's true. I think that's positive. Yeah. Um, I think, I think there's other things that are more important in, in my estimation. Oh yeah, no, no, that, it, that are results of it. But but it's certainly, but art is important, and you know, I think that's something in you know Western culture generally where we see a lack of appreciation for things. You see, a, I see a lot of. Uh, people online trying to talk about how you know colleges shouldn't even teach the humanities anymore <laughs> which to me is like you, you, you apparently you don't even want to have any culture and then right because yeah what are you going to have left then you know a bunch of engineers yeah well and i think that uh, this is the thing, right? And you even see this with, uh, you know, Freemasons or uh, uh, maybe even occultists sometimes, but certainly with f uh, some some Freemasons and writers on Freemasonry, that they uh, they put rationalism on a pedestal. And definitely people should be able to think rationally, and that's important. And some people <laughs> don't think rationally. But, um, but rationalism... Is never going to give us anything meaningful, really. No one, uh, no one is inspired by rationalism. Uh, they're just not. But people are inspired by art. And well, uh, you're you're talking about like what what I interpret is like rationalism, like in the modern age. But yeah, when I when I because this is I've encountered this idea and I've wrestled with it a bit myself because in Massachusetts the Grand Lodge motto is follow reason yeah so, and I was like well what, that seems odd you know Freemasonry follow reason like yeah how does that fit exactly but I think what what I interpret it as is in, in in times past when you had this idea of rationalism or in, in the enlightenment period you know you mm. were thinking of rationalism in terms of like uh, scientific discovery uh, think of Isaac Newton sort of figuring out the mechanics of the solar system that was seen as rationalism you know and that was enlightened discovery and and I think today we our idea of rationalism is so much it's so much more reduced and uh, confined in a yeah. way well, I would also say that I think, you know, uh, Hegel, that, who I spend a lot of time reading, would also be rationalism. And I think if you read Hegel, his his uh, uh, ultimate feelings are that uh, that anything other than rationalism is sort of backward, basically. Right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and anything other than dialectic is somehow sort of a throwback to primitive man that we don't need. And we, yeah. we almost don't need the body and we almost don't need to exist. We could just be sort of algorithms. And I think yeah. Hegel would have been thrilled, you know. So sure. Yeah, I, I very much have any anybody who's an extreme like uh who gets too extreme, um Yeah. It's troubling. But I, but here's the thing though. <laughs> it's another one of these paradoxes that you encounter in esotericism you have to be kind of extreme in order to reach the heights of of this path or experience or uh, yeah. state of consciousness yeah. you know there's no great uh attainer who wasn't extreme 
No, that's right. And obviously, if you want to produce even you know great art or great literature, you do have to be a, a bit of an extremist in some way. But um, I mean, I, I think that um, people who really do something great, uh, obviously, they are a bit extreme. But um, the, they usually have a, a great deal of understanding as well. So. Oh, certainly. I think that's that's crucial. I mean, yeah. Well, I, I think this is a, a good point to wrap it up. So maybe you, uh, Greg, you could just tell us a, a little bit about a cult of personality and um, h- uh, how people can um, find out more about you and about the podcast. Sure. So uh, you can find the podcast at occultofpersonality.net features uh, an extensive archive of recorded interviews, audio interviews with esoteric authors and experts um, from a wide range of traditions and covering many different subjects including alchemy, tarot, Freemasonry, secret societies, conspiracies, alternative history, uh, and many subjects uh, pretty widely divergent. There's something for everyone there. And it's been around for about 10 years now. I think we've done over 160 episodes. And there's many more to come. Uh, you can uh, connect with our the, cult, the Occult of Personality Facebook page or Occult of Personality on Twitter. Um, you can contact me at occultofpersonality at gmail.com or the contact page on the website. There's also the Occult of Personality membership section, which also offers uh, even more extensive uh, interviews, um, kind of going deeper, delving even more deeply into these subjects with uh, the guests of the show. And uh, there's an archive of well over 100 interviews in the membership section for a low monthly fee, which goes to support the production of the free podcast. Mm -hmm. So if people are able to and they enjoy the show, I would encourage them to subscribe to the membership section because that is the only way that the free podcast is able to keep going. Um, yeah. and, I, and I do want to mention also that I'm, I'm working very hard on getting a new app for the membership section oh. for, uh, you know, for Android and iPhone. Oh, okay. And I'm also working at the same time on building a brand new uh, website uh, for the membership section um, to sort of uh, give it a facelift, improve the functionality, um, and make it easier for people to access. And uh, I'm hoping to roll those things out this summer as soon as I'm able. Okay, that sounds great. Yeah. Cool. Well, thanks very much for speaking with us, and uh, it's been great. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Angel. I appreciate it.